Yeah. Hey, just for like 24 hours, one day my prayer is like, I just want a rocky voice. You know, like, okay, wouldn't that be cool? Like, my, my two choices, like, it's either a rocky voice or an Australian accent. You know what I mean? It just, it just be super cool to do. I mean, just like for 24 hours, then that's got to be me. You know what I mean? But it's cool. Again, I want to welcome you to church. Hey, real quick, before I dive into what I want to talk about today, um, just want to say, uh, put the 23rd, uh, February 23rd on your calendar, okay? Um, it, it's kind of a big deal. Not only are we celebrating four years, um, but we're also going to try our best. We're working really hard at it to celebrate kind of like the official opening of the building, right? Uh, we've kind of already been working in this space, and you've seen the improvements here. Uh, the lobby should be finished. The patio should be finished. The multi-purpose space next door should be finished. And so we want, we want to celebrate that with you. And so we're going um, we're gonna to dedicate everything to God on that weekend. And so the way we're doing it is we're doing our, our four services like normal, but we want you to come in the morning for, for service. There's going to be some special things going on there, some special guests that are going to be joining us for that day. And then we're asking you to come back at 6 p.m. and we want to pack this place out, right, for a praise party. It's a worship night. And I'm telling you, if you've been to, to one of our worship nights or one of our worship weekends, this is next level, okay? I'm just saying, you're not going to want to miss it. You're going to want to be a part of it. You, you don't want to hear from your friends about it. Let's just put it that way, okay? You, you're going to want to be a part of it and you're going to want to be here. It's going to be a special time. So I want to encourage you just to, uh, to make some room for that in your schedule. But today, we're going to dive into the final part of Made for More, uh, week number five of a series of discussions we've been in that's talking about refining your God-given potential. And I want to give you a heads up up front. Uh, This, out of all the messages, we've heard incredible feedback about what God's doing in your life, about him opening up your eyes to seeing how you're made for more, about about God speaking something into your heart in a timely way. I I just want to give you an advance warning. This, This message today, it just might not be your favorite out of the five. Okay, it might not, we're going to talk about another test that I think is an incredibly important test, just like the others. It's not just got physical implications, very much has spiritual implications, but here's what I know. It's probably going to just kind of rub you funny a little bit. It's probably going to stir up all kinds of emotions. It might even stir up all kinds of questions, and that's okay. Let's just wrestle with it together, okay? Let's lean in and let's learn together, okay? Let's learn from scripture. Let's learn what God has to say as it relates to this test that happens in our life. And if it's still at the end of the day, you don't like it, uh, there's two things going for you today. One, we had baptisms, okay? And, and, and two, just based on time, this will be the shortest one out of the five, okay? So it's all, it's all good, okay? So you can hang in there and, and, and you can have a good time tracking with this. Let's start with something fun, just so you can kind of see if we're all tracking in the same direction. We're going to do a fill in that blank challenge. I know some of you love to already guess the blanks that are in your notes already. So I just figured let's just do it all together as a church and see how we do at this, okay? Can you fill in these blanks? Links. You can't tell me what to do. Okay, very good. That's good. You guys got the first one. You can see how this is going to go. For those of you that are scared, you can still talk in church out loud in response, okay? Uh, you're not the boss. Okay, boss of me. That's good. Man, you guys are awesome. You're not my, okay, my mom, or we just put parents because, you know, we got to honor all of them, okay? Um, I don't have to do what you, okay, so there's a reason why you all know that. There's a reason why this came so natural. (laughs) Such is the reason why I'm talking about this test today, okay? It's known as the test of authority. The test of authority. This test of authority is an an interesting one because this test of authority comes with a question. It's do you value and appreciate the authority that God's placed in your life? Do you value and do you appreciate the authority that God has placed in your life? In your life. And here's my assumption based on our little game and experiment here. From an early age, our tendency is to push against, to kick against authority, to push away from authority, to somehow defy authority. We don't like authority in our life because our desire is just to kind of do it our way, how we want to do it. We don't want anybody to tell us how to do it. We don't want to have to fit into somebody else's design. We kind of just want to be our own director, right? We don't want to have to be accountable for our actions. We don't want to have to own our decisions. We just want to do what we want to do, how we want to do it, and in large part, without having to be aware of the consequences that could come from it. We, we just, we just want to kind of be our own. Even in extremes, you might even be able to say, like, we kind of have a tendency to want to be, like, the, the, the director or lord of our own life. Hence this idea of, of the human condition. This idea of sin and humanity, that that God created us to be in a love relationship with God, but but in God directing our life, we kicked against God's authority in our life. 
And because we kicked against God's authority in our life, it created distance between us and God, a fragmented, broken relationship between us and God. And forever we have dealt with authority issues moving forward. Let's just be honest. Authority is not a popular word, right? There's nothing like handsome about it. Like there's nothing like, mm, that feels good. Say that again. You know what I mean? Like nobody does that when it comes to authority. Right, Because all of us feel some weird way about authority. Because in our culture, although there are great examples of authority, how many of you know there just seems to be way too often like really bad examples of unhealthy authority that have unfortunately led to destructive things? We see those things and we, and we, we, we don't know how to process that. The good news is, is that Jesus was no stranger to the concept of authority. In fact, Jesus, having grown up in a Jewish family in a territory of the Roman Empire, Jesus understood the importance and complexity of authority, especially with authority that you didn't agree with. Jesus actually was constantly questioned about his authority. In fact, one particular day, there was Pharisees and what Scripture calls spies, spies that came to try to catch Jesus in a trap. And as they tried to catch Jesus in a trap, they were trying to find cause to arrest him. So they presented him with a question a question that they thought was, was, was kind of a no-win situation. If he said one thing, he's busted. If he says the other way, he's busted. But Jesus does something amazing. They, they present the question like this. This is perfect timing for most of us, right? Now, now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Understand, Jesus coming from a Jewish culture. For Jesus to say yes, in their opinion, for Jesus to say yes, you pay Caesar his taxes, it would mean he was defying his own, his own nation. He was defying his own religion. He would have been seen as like, hey, you, you don't you call yourself God? I mean, you would, you would pay something to these oppressors, to these people who are kind of sticking it to us? Yet at the same time, if Jesus was to say, no, no, you don't have to pay Caesar taxes, then he would be considered a rebel against Rome. And they would cause all kinds of discussion, disturbance about Jesus trying to caution people about being obedient to the idea of what Rome had instilled. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Listen to Jesus' response. He saw right through their trickery and he says this, can you show me a Roman coin? So they show him a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Whose picture and title are on the coin that you have? And they said, Caesar, they replied. Now that's funny, right? We've got currency with all kinds of faces on it. They had currency. It just simply said Caesar. It was Caesar's face. It was Caesar's money. To which Jesus' response, well then, since it's Caesar's face and it's apparently Caesar's money, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. That makes perfect sense, right? If he says, give me what's mine, you, you, you obey that authority and you give that to him. But he also says, and give to God what belongs to God. So when they think they're going to catch him in a trap, Jesus goes above and beyond, and he says, let me give you a a better holistic view of what's happening. He says, you who call yourself righteous, you who are following God, the reality for you is that you become obedient to the authority that is over you, even in the world around you. You give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The problem with that is that Caesar didn't just want his money, Caesar wanted worship. Caesar wanted people to bow down to him. Caesar wanted people to say, oh, hell, Caesar, you know. But, but Jesus was very clear. Give Caesar his money for, I mean, his face is on it. I mean, just go ahead and let him have it. But make no mistake about it. There is no authority higher than God. You continue to give God what God deserves, and that is our worship, that you worship God, that he is king of kings, that he is Lord of lords. There, there is no one greater than God. See, it's so fascinating that Jesus reveals for us in this moment a response to authority, particularly corrupt authority, right? And that's a a huge reality for us because here's what I want to suggest. Sometimes our greatest test involving authority usually comes when we disagree with authority. Ever notice that? When you're in agreement with authority, you're like, sweet. When you went to your parents and they said, hey, hey can, I, can I go to so-and-so's house? And they were like, yeah, no problem. You're like, yeah, I love you. I'll see you tonight. Right? But when they said no, what happened? I can't go. Right? There's a direct disagreement with authority, and now you're feeling some kind of way towards the authority that you disagree with. Isn't it true? We all experience that in and through our life. But here's what I want us to understand today. While we may want to change or challenge authority God is wanting to change and challenge our attitude towards authority. 
While it's easy to want to push against authority, kick against authority, the authority that God has placed or established in your life, God is trying to challenge and change your attitude towards that authority. That's exactly what the authority test does. It always reveals our attitudes towards the authority figures that are in our life. If we struggle with people telling us what to do, this test will reveal it. If we struggle or resent people who are over us, right, this test will reveal it. If we despise those in authority because we think they have some kind of privileges that we don't have, this test will often reveal it. Why? Because it goes about our attitude. Why is attitude so important? Attitude is important because it's the inner condition of the heart and thoughts. They're the hidden intentions that we have, which will eventually serve as the basis for our actions. Our attitude affects the way we live. Our attitude affects our outlook. Our attitude affects the way that we respond. And you and I know this. Let's just be honest for a second. Before we can change our attitude towards authority, we have to look at what it looks like to have a negative attitude towards authority. And you've probably seen it in your life. You, won't, you probably won't hold yourself accountable to it, but isn't it true that sometimes a wrong attitude towards authority could just be disrespect towards authority? There's a person in position in your life, they have a certain role in your life, but there's a disrespect towards them. You, you, maybe you talk bad about them because you don't agree with them or you don't like them or whatever it is, so, so you disrespect them. You, you harshly criticize them for everything that they do. Maybe if it's not disrespect, maybe it's disobedience towards authority. Disobedience is that which it's already been mapped out for you what to do. You were asked to do this, but sometimes instead of doing what you know is right based on the authority and the structure that's in place, you tend to just do the opposite. <laughs> or you try to cut corners and do just enough to say, well, that's okay. No, you're, a little bit of disobedience is still disobedience entirely. Think about this for a second. It's not just disobedience. It's, it's not just disrespect. But sometimes it results in just outright defiance, doesn't it? Where you know the right response, you know what you've been asked to do, the authority in your life has handed this down to you, but at the same time, you choose to ignore the authority in your life, pretend like they don't exist, as if they have no worth and value, and you just don't do anything. You don't just do the opposite, you just do nothing out of outright defiance. Unhealthy attitudes towards the authority. The question is, do you appreciate the authority that God has placed in your life, the authority test. What does that look like in our life? Paul, Paul understood a thing or two about authority. And he understood that it's not so much about the errors of those that are in authority as it is about having a right attitude towards the authority that God has placed in our life. Paul was talking to Christ followers at Rome in the book of Romans. Uh, the, The place of the Roman government, right? The central hub where it's oppressive, it's strenuous, it's restrictive, it's it's taxing in most cases. And listen to what Paul says. Paul says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. I'm just let that sink in for a little bit. Because that's a big statement. And then he follows it up with this statement. He says, the authorities that exist have been established by God. In other words, he says, I know it's hard to understand our finite minds in respect to God's infinite thinking and God's reason and purpose behind what's he he doing in our life. But he says the reality is these authorities, there's none higher than God. There's none greater than God. God can remove them. He can wipe them out. He can get rid of them. He can never let them get into authority. But for whatever reason, in God's sovereignty, he allows people in positions of leadership. They become an authority in our life. Whether you can explain it in detail or not, Paul says they're they're there. So he says, so consequently, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so, guess what happens? They bring judgment upon themselves. So God says there's a reason and a purpose for authority in our life. That authority is supposed to direct. Authority is supposed to lead. Authority is supposed to protect. Authority is supposed to help. And sometimes when we want to push away against it, we want to push against that because we don't understand it, we disagree with it. He says the reality is this idea of rebelling against. I mean, some, some of you, you, you lived in a culture where this idea of rebel, that was like a cool thing. Oh, he's such a rebel, right? Some of you, 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 you lived in, a, in another environment or went to a church background where it's like everything was talking about rebellion. It's rebellious, it's rebellious, right? Maybe like your parents told you that too. Such, such a rebellious little, you know, whatever, you know, right? The words that they use. <laughs> Either way, right? 
we know that these words, they rub us, they rub us odd. This idea of authority, it rubs us weird. The idea of rebelling rubs us weird. But we can't deny the fact that if we choose to rebel against the established authority in our life, Scripture is clear that, that we have to deal with the consequences and the results of that. Why? Because it goes back to our attitude. Paul talks about in Romans 12, to let God renew your attitude, to change your outlook towards what's going on in your life, to help you see that you are made for more. In other words, to recognize Jesus as Lord of your life or ultimate authority in your life is to also recognize the authorities that he's placed in your life. So what does that look like? How, how do we aim towards a good attitude towards authority? I think it begins with a few things, and I'm going to kind of quickly go through them. So if you're following along in your notes, I hope you'll write these things down. I think they're, they're helpful to you. A good attitude towards authority be, simply begins with, first, a recognition of the authority that's in your life. Because sometimes we get so disconnected and we get so wrapped up into doing life our way and our own way that we forget that God has actually put people in authority in our life. What does that look like? I'll suggest three of you, three that I think fit in our context uh, perfectly. The first is your parents or your guardians, right? The, the, the people that, that, that help raise you. If they're in a position of authority in your life, and here's what I know, when I talk about parents, when I talk about guardians, when I talk about the people that raised you, there's all kinds of emotion that come with that because you have an idea of what a good parent is or what a bad parent is or what an absent parent is or what a, you know, a, a non-existent parent is. You have all these ideas of what that looks like, and so you're kind of thinking like, well, well, my case is different because this, the reality is, is if they're your parent, if they're your guardian, they still have a position of authority in your life. You don't have to agree with every decision. You don't have to like everything that they did, but they still have a position of authority in your life. And according to Scripture, Exodus 20, 12 says that you honor your father and your mother, that there's this idea of, of treating them with a the right attitude. It's approaching them with the right attitude, even when you don't always agree, even when you don't always understand, even when you wish that things could be different and you can't figure out why they did the things that they did, we still have a choice to make to honor our father and our mother. And then this is also tagged in with a blessing. He says, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. He says that there, there's, there's blessing attached to choosing a good attitude towards the authority that's in your life. It's so important for us to understand. Just like Paul says, when we push against it, we rebel against it, we have to suffer the own judgment that we have to deal with on ourselves, whatever, whatever's coming to us. But if you can lean into the authority, even in times that are hard, and I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end, the reality is, is there's blessing in store for you. It's, our, it's your, your parents, your, your family, or maybe it's those in positions of authority in your life. What am I saying about positions of authority? I, I'm talking about uh, your boss. <laughs> I'm talking about your teachers. I'm talking about your school administrators. I'm talking about your coaches. I'm talking about community leaders. And yes, as much as it feels weird to say it, I'm talking about governmental leaders as well. You can't deny the fact that they're in positions of authority. And the way that you respond to them, it's not so much about what they're doing as it is your response. In other words, it's not so much about the mistakes and errors that they make. Even when authority fails, God is still looking for your response. God is still looking. Those in positions of authority, what does Scripture say? Have confidence in your leaders, and here's a word that you're going to love, submit. You're like, man, you're giving us all the bad vocabulary today, right? Like authority, you know what I'm saying, rebel, Submit, yeah, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Why? Because they keep watch over you, listen to this, as those who must give an account. Give an account to you, who? God, the ultimate authority. So you're like, well, yeah, I don't like the way they did this. I don't like the decision that they made. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm right for feeling this way. I can justify why I treated him that way and why I said those things out of my frustration. The reality is, though, you're still responsible for your attitude towards authority. And scripture teaches us that we should have confidence in those that are in authority in our life to the best of our ability, that we submit to them, right? That means that we, we come under that leadership and, and we choose to listen, we choose to try to learn, we, we choose to try to process what they're saying because we understand and know that even though we want to tell them how we feel, they still have to give an account to God. They still have to give an account to their actions before God. So he says, do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. How many of you know that when your boss is tripping, 
you want to be tripping right back. Right? Is it true? When your boss is having a bad day, you're like, we're all going to have a bad day. You know that, right? Because they're not very happy in their job right now. They got stressed. They got this. They got that. But could it be, though, that your attitude towards them can make a difference? Could it be that your attitude towards them is not helping the situation? And if your attitude towards them is a negative attitude in which they're already frustrated with what's going on, Scripture is clear, well, that's, at the end of the day, not going to be a benefit to you. But what if things, what if things could actually be different? Okay. Those in positions of authority, what about this? Pastors and church leaders. People in positions of authority, pastors and church leaders, which Scripture is clear that they're shepherds and they're overseers. In other words, pastors and church leaders, it's not just some job that you take on. It's not just some random job. It, it's a specific call of God on a person's life. It, it's a serious thing. It's not for everyone because there's massive responsibility with being entrusted with people under your care. And so this is what Scripture says. Scripture says the elders who direct the affairs of the church, well, they're, they're, they're worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. I don't know who that is, right? But he says those, those pastors and church leaders, because their role is significant, because they're helping people discover and follow Jesus, because they're shepherding people along the way, you can kick against, you can push against, and it's frustrating for everybody, or we can work alongside. We can choose a different approach. We can choose a better attitude towards our leadership. Okay? It's, it's knowing who's in those positions of authority. It's also knowing what it's like to be in and under authority. What is it like to be in and under authority? It's always going to be easy to talk about your disappointments with authority. It's always going to be easy to kind of just talk about like how you're frustrated with them and, and even think that, you know what, you would do better at that role than they, than they are, right? Like if you were in that position, you would crush it. You, you would do way better than them. But the reality is, is only when, when you know what it's like to be in as well as under authority can you generally appreciate the blessing of authority. It, it's only until you get to a certain point where you understand that before you can, can learn to be over, you first got to learn to serve under. In other words, until you learn how to serve someone else's vision that's not your own, you'll never be ready to lead. I know that's a big statement, but, but it's so powerful and it's so true. There's a Roman centurion that knew that about Jesus. He recognized Jesus' authority, but he wasn't trying to put an overly taxing burden upon Jesus. He comes to Jesus and says, my servant is sick. He sends a message to him. He says, Jesus, if you can't come, I understand. You're a busy guy. Everybody wants a part of your time. He says, if you'll just send somebody in your place, I trust in your authority that you can still heal him. In fact, if you don't have anybody to send in their place, then you know what? You can just say the word and it'll be done because I recognize your authority. He says, for I myself am a man under authority, right, with soldiers who are under me. And I tell this one, go, and he goes, and I tell that one, come, and he comes, and, and I say to my servant, do this, and he actually does it. He says, I understand what that's like. And only until you can understand what that's like can you fully appreciate that role of authority. Until then, all you want to do is just talk about how that, that authority should be different. It should be better. It should be changed. Something's got to happen. But understand this, okay? This is important for you to know that, again, before you can learn to be over, you first have to learn to be under. And the third is this. We have to learn to accept God's word concerning authority. To accept God's word concerning authority. Authority. This is going to be so important for us to recognize. It's, it's an important to remember that the scriptures that are brought to us are brought to us by men and women who have the same kind of experiences with authority as you and I do. Guys like Peter, Peter who ultimately uh, would, would be killed for his faith in Jesus. He lived in a difficult time facing severe persecution. But listen to what Peter says. He says, submit, here it is again, our favorite word, submit yourself. Why would you submit yourselves to authority? He says, there's a reason for it. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. For the Lord, you love God. God is the ultimate authority in your life. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or, or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and, and commend those who do right. He says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. <laughs> you, bring, you, you begin to silence 
what people are saying about your bad attitude. <laughs> you begin to silence the, those people that say, you call yourself a Christian and you act like that. He says, yeah, when you respond counterculturally, when you respond God's way, it changes the dynamic. You, be now, you now become the light in a dark place. You become something different that people aren't used to. And it's so incredibly impactful that you begin to silence the foolish talk around you. He says, live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves or live as God's servants. God has set you free. You've been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Your sins have been forgiven. But that doesn't give you a right to just go off and do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, without any accountability. He says, you submit to the authority in your life because you are God's servant. You recognize God as the ultimate authority in your life, so you show proper respect to everyone. You love the family of believers. You fear God. You honor the emperor or the one that's in that ultimate authority in your life. You see some themes here. And I know sometimes it, it's hard to, to kind of unpack. It's kind of, it's hard to digest, but this is what it looks like to have a God-honoring response. You're like, wait, but what about all the bad authority? And what all about the terrible authority? And what about all the junk that has come? Yeah, understand, I get it, it's real. But again, even when authority fails, God is looking for our response. Do you think Jesus responded to Caesar the way that he did because he thought Caesar was an awesome guy? He responded to Caesar the way he responded to Caesar because he recognized Caesar's position of authority. But he did so while at the same time honoring God as ultimate authority. That because God was ultimate authority in his life, he can respond in a right way to Caesar's authority. It's knowing that God and his authority is over you helps us to respond in this way because you know that God and his authority, it covers you. It covers you. God is with you in it. So let's just breathe a second. We got a few minutes left. I'm going to give you a couple highlights. And let's just say, this is only a test. Go ahead. It's only a test. Right? But the test is there for your benefit. The test is there for your good. But like we've been saying all along, if you only see your circumstance or your situation as negative, as not positive, then you miss the opportunity for growth and development through the process. Okay? Don't miss out on the growth and opportunity. Let's talk real quick about passing the authority test. Passing the authority test. I'm going to give you three quick ideas. And they all kind of tag on each other. And it turns into one big idea. So if you can get a hold of this, I feel like we accomplished good stuff today. Right? Understand this. Passing the authority test means this. Choose honor. Choose honor. Right? We live in a culture that is a culture and a society of dishonor. You don't believe me? You can look on Instagram, Facebook, your Twitter feed, Fox News, CNN, whatever your choice. You don't have to look far to see that we are a dishonoring culture. But the definition of honor is fascinating. Treat with value, high esteem, give worth or weight. This comes from how God sees us. That God in his love for us has given us value, has given us worth. And we recognize that with people who are in authority in our life, we can treat them in a right way, in a God-honoring way. Because we not only see them for who they are, but we understand that God sees them and God loves them and God cares for them. And the same God that sent his son to die for you and I is the same God that sent his son to die for them. And through your ability to choose honor, you become a light even to the authority that's in your life. You begin to change the dynamic and the authority in your life. Why? Because honor, it lifts up. Honor, it builds up. You know what dishonor does? Dishonor means to treat as ordinary or common. To just treat as ordinary or common. If honor builds up, then you have to recognize that dishonor tears down. Dishonor continues to tear down. But Romans 3.17, Paul says, give everyone what you owe them. He says, if you owe, and he starts talking about money, he starts talking about taxes. He says, if it's respect, then respect. If it's honor, then honor. Why is that so important? Because honor is hard sometimes, and I get it. I know what you're rubbing against. But listen to me. When you choose honor, understand this. Respect might be earned, but honor is freely given. You got to know. You might not always agree. You might not always like. Respect might be lost because of their actions or because of their decisions. Although respect is earned, honor is still freely given. You choose to honor others. Whether we agree or disagree with our authorities in our life, showing them honor is presented in scriptures to us as something that's really non-negotiable. 
that when we become devoted to one another, things change. Romans 12, 10, Paul says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, outdo each other in honor. How do you outdo each other in honor, especially as it relates to those who who are in authority in your life? I would say, pray for them, serve alongside them, walk in obedience with them, right? Encourage them, be a help to them. Do your best to learn from them. Get this, even if you're learning all the wrong things to not do in your future. I'll be honest with you, in my, in my ministry experience, I've been a part of some things that I look back and I said, you know what? I don't know if I'd do it that way. I don't know, I, I mean, man, I don't know. But I feel like God had me in that setting in that moment for whatever reason to learn not only things to do, but also to learn some things not to do. But it all came down to my attitude towards authority, what I choose to honor or what I choose to dishonor authority. Scripture calls us to show honor, to outdo each other in honor. And understand this, honor is born out of a heart that is surrendered to Jesus. Honor ultimately is is, is about a heart surrendered to Jesus. As our worship team comes back out, they're they're gonna sing one last song with us here this morning. Understand that, that because of who Jesus is, Right? Because of who Jesus is, it changes the way that we approach the authority in our life. And like I said, we live in a dishonoring culture. And here's what I want to suggest about that. I think the reason that our culture is so dishonoring is because people haven't first learned how to honor God. When you begin to honor God fully in your life, your choice to honor others is actually born out of your heart that is surrendered to Jesus. It starts with honoring God. When you're able to see God as who he is, what am I saying? When you're no longer treating God as common or ordinary. When you're no longer just saying, oh, sweet, eight ounce, nine pound, you know, baby Jesus. Ba- he's, not a, he's not a baby no more. Right? When you're saying, oh, he's just the big guy upstairs or he's some distant, far away person that's aloof to my situation. No, you have to understand that this is God we're talking about. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He sent a rescue. He sent a savior. He came into our life when we were lost and he turned things around. It's this God who loves us and cares for us that his love is relentless. That's the kind of God that we celebrate. That's the kind of God that we honor. That when we turned our back on on God, God came chasing us down. God came pursuing us because he so desperately wanted a relationship with us. It's no longer this common or ordinary relationship with Jesus. It's that because of Jesus and what he has done for us and the fact that his, his stamp of approval is on our life and that makes us worthwhile and valuable, it gives us the opportunity to respond to authority in a different way. Peter says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Your response to authority matters. The way you choose to respond to authority matters. And when you honor those who God has placed in authority over you, you ultimately honor God. You ultimately honor God. We're going to need to let the next service in here real soon. So your last two fill-ins, I know you can't leave without them. I don't have time to explain them, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just give you the two fill-ins, and then I'm going to ask you to go online and listen to the 830. I said it at the end right there. Or you'll you'll listen to the 1130 because I'll have plenty of time, right, to talk. But here's what I know. To spend time with a family that is hurting, I'll give up time for that, Right? To celebrate life change by the power of Jesus Christ through baptism, I'll give up time for that. It's not about me and what I think I need to say. It's about God and who he is and what he wants to do. Amen, somebody? We can catch up on this later, but here's just what you know. I know some of you are thinking, but terrible things have happened with people in authority in your life. Terrible stuff has happened. You wish it didn't happen, but it's, 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 it's scarred your life. Or it's currently hurting you right now. Here, here's what I need you to know. You you do have a responsibility to respond, but there's always a right way. This is their feeling. There's always a right way, right way to respond to wrong authority. There's always a right way to respond to wrong authority. And the first is this. You can appeal to higher authority. That's your feeling. Appeal to higher authority. Because authority is often delegated, that authority figure in your life might not be the ultimate authority. You go to them, you pray for them, you have a conversation with them, you don't talk about them or around them, you, you, you go to them 
If that doesn't work, then you appeal to higher authority. If you appeal to higher authority and nothing changes and nothing gets fixed, your next fill-in is you can peacefully withdraw. Peacefully withdraw doesn't mean you leave in a ruckus. It doesn't mean that you wreck shop on your way out. And it doesn't mean that you choose to leave the wrong way or until God has released you. Because just because you leave doesn't mean that things are necessarily going to get better for you in the future if you went out the wrong way. So I want to encourage you, follow up on that, think about that, let's stand at our feet, let's worship God together. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now, God, and I thank you for your care, for your love, your guidance. God, we thank you that you want good in our lives, and we thank you, God, that we're made for more. Father, we want to live into the more that you've created us for. So, Father, sometimes these tests are hard, they're difficult. But, God, I pray that we would not disregard them, but that we would wrestle through them. Lord, that we would respond in a God-honoring way. And, God, that you would change our lives as we live into our full potential in you. In Jesus' name.